and thank you, Brother Dalton. If you have your Bibles, open to the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel, as we go back to the story of David and Goliath. Boy, I preached on it last Sunday, when your giant looks too big. To sum up the service from last week, the sermon from last week, if your giant looks too big, you're looking through the wrong end of the binoculars. For more detail, go on YouTube and watch the sermon last week. We're back to the story of David and Goliath. I just couldn't get away from it this past week. I was reading my devotions and happened to be in that passage again in my, just, my daily devotional time. And the Lord brought some other thoughts to me about this. And I love the story of David and Goliath. I hope I never get tired of the stories from God's Word. The ones that I enjoy the most, I love hearing again and again. And who doesn't love the story of David and Goliath where the young, small, smaller than the giant boy beats the big, ugly Goliath, all right? What a tremendous story, a tremendous truth. So much in the Word of God is practical for you and for me. The Bible says that the Word of God is profitable for us. And we often look to solve supernatural problems with natural means but you have to solve problems with God's help supernaturally you see God solves our problems if we let him in the story of David and Goliath give your Bible open to 1st Samuel 17 there are a number of elements that I believe are worth noting but this morning I want to focus on part way through the story where David has his faith challenged when we face a problem, sometimes we respond the right way. Sometimes we respond in a manner of faith toward God, who we know can solve the problems. But sometimes, even in those responses, other people will challenge our faith. And it happened right here in the account, in the story of David and Goliath. I've entitled this sermon, Let Go and Let God. Let go and let God. In fact, we kind of find that if you look in 1 Samuel 17. And if you look in verse 46, we kind of get the title for this message. And then I'll give you the subtitle. In verse 46, this day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. Would you read that with me or say that with me? For the battle is the Lord's. One more time. For the battle is, is mine? Is it my problem? Not my problem. Is it your problem? Now, the Bible says David had it right, didn't he? For the battle is, help me, the Lord's. Let go and let God. See where I got that from? Let go and let God. I read about a young man. A young man who had a broken printer for his computer. So he called the repair shop. The repair shop said, well, sir, it sounds like it just needs a good cleaning. If you look in your manual, you can clean it, and you should be able to fix it all by yourself. The young man was quite surprised on the phone, and he said to the technician on the phone at the repair shop, well, that's surprising. I have never had anyone tell me to fix it myself. It seemed like you couldn't stay in business long. Does your boss know, does the owner of the company know that you're telling people how to fix this problem? The technician said, well, absolutely. In fact, it was his idea. Because we often get to fix the printers of people who fix it themselves first. <laughs> How many times do you and I try to fix our own printers? When God says, the battle's mine, let go and let God. The battle is the Lord's. Lord, I pray for the time this morning. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be encouraged, that our strength would be, that our faith would be strengthened. Lord, that our, our minds would be turned towards you. Lord, I don't know all the struggles that are being faced this morning. I don't know all the conflict that someone has come to church with, Lord, but you do. But Lord, I know, I know that your strength is perfect, that you hold it tomorrow. That even in the valley, you're good. Lord, Lord we've sung about your faithfulness this morning. Sung about your strength. 
But Lord, now would you encourage our hearts, would you touch us and change us this morning. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. I don't know what problems you may be facing this morning. We could go through and we could have a problem contest, could we not? And we could give an award for the biggest problem that's presented here today, and many people would enter the problem contest. Oh, you think that's a problem? Let me tell you about my problem, or if I can, let me tell you about my giant. But I don't know all the problems that we face this morning. There are some that are kind of universal to human beings. Sometimes we face health crises, report from a doctor, other medical professional. And those can be overwhelming in our life. Sometimes we face relational problems, a problem between a husband and a wife, or between a child and a parent, or between a parent and, and, and a, or an older child and an older parent. There can be problems, relational problems. It could be at work between an employer and an employee, or between two co-workers. Real problems, real giants in our lives. Sometimes there are health problems, sometimes there are relational problems, and sometimes there are financial problems. Financial problems where we just don't seem to make enough to cover what we spend. And sometimes the financial problems are of our own doing, right? Sometimes we've got ourselves in that mess, sometimes it was nothing that we did and we're just in a mess. Just in a mess. I don't know what problems you may face today, and you may not be in a problem, but you may be in one tomorrow. When David showed up at the battlefield, he did not come expecting to see a Goliath, but when he showed up, Goliath was there. And all of a sudden, a problem that David didn't know about was affecting David. If you remember the story of David and Goliath, uh, Goliath had said to the armies, he said, choose you someone to fight me, and whoever wins, wins for the whole country. If you beat me, the Philistine will serve you, Israel, but if I beat you, the whole country will serve me. So, in fact, David had a problem and didn't even know about it. See, sometimes we have problems and we don't even know about them yet. Sometimes we're surprised by a problem we don't even see coming in our life. But the wonderful truth is that no matter what problem we may face, or if I can, no matter what giant may be there, God is able to help us and deliver us. Nothing is bigger than God, the creator of the universe. You say, well, pastor, that's nice and dandy for you. You're a pastor. But uh, I don't know if I believe that or not. We find in our Bibles in the very first pages in Genesis 1 verse 1 where the Bible says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. From the very first pages of the Bible we see the power of God. You can read throughout the Old Testament of the ways that God solved problems. He solved them in a multitude of ways. One time he used hornets. I wish I could have been there for that one. I wish I could have been there when God used hornets. You think you're a big bad army, nothing against a little hornet stinging you. I've been stung before. I've almost fallen off a roof being stung by a hornet. You want to get away from these things. They're nasty little things, aren't they? Those bald-faced hornets, they're just angry at life. Angry at life, like the black mamba snake. It'll bite you just because. God can use a multitude of ways to solve problems. And beyond that, I've seen it in my life where God has solved problems that sometimes I've created, but sometimes I've been caught in. God can solve problems, and God is able to solve problems. We have to let go and let God. But we can do that. We can say, okay, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to put my faith that God will solve this problem. And sometimes, not everyone understands. You start coming to church. Your neighbor's like, what are you doing every Sunday? Going to that church with that young pastor? He's terrible. And they'd be right. You're going there all the time. You, you tell me that you, you, you put your faith in Jesus? You're one of those, those, those Jesus freaks? You mean you actually, you actually kind of give sometimes to the church too? That's a terrible investment. You must invest your money in the stock market. That's a good investment. 
Our faith will be challenged. And if I could turn your attention in the, in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17 to beginning in verse number 31 through verse number 37, we have a, a time in this account, in this story, where David's faith is challenged. David has seen Goliath. He has heard Goliath. He's found out what's going to happen. And now David is standing before the king of Israel. King Saul is his name. King Saul is a tall individual. In fact, the Bible tells us that when he was crowned king, he stood head and shoulders above everyone else in the whole country. Saul was the tallest man in the whole country of Israel. And now David, young David, is standing before King Saul. David's been asking around about what happens and why is this guy, Goliath, allowed to just blaspheme God and to say these things? Why isn't someone standing up for God? And David's been saying these things over and over. And finally, they've hauled David before King Saul. If you look in verse number 31... David says this, he says, and when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, he sent for them. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. I see, first of all, that David, when he was called before Saul, when his faith was challenged, David reported with focus and with faith. I kind of put myself there as a fly on the wall in this tent. Saul's heard what David's saying, and now David shows up there, and David says this. Let no man's heart fail him. Don't worry about it, King Saul. I'll go fight Goliath. Now think about the audacity of this statement. Every time that Goliath is shouted before, the men who were supposed to fight, the warriors, including King Saul, went and hid in their tents like a bunch of scared little children. Every time. And now this young man, maybe 15, maybe 17 years old, is in the tent of King Saul, the king of Israel, and says, listen, don't worry about it, I'm right here. I'll fight for you, I got your back, don't worry about it. Now what would you say if your entire freedom and your entire country rested upon this one fight and a young 15-year-old teenager says, I've got it. I know what I would say. You've lost your ever-loving mind. You see, David's faith was challenged. I see with David, there's a courage there. He was willing to face what others wouldn't face, willing to go where others wouldn't go, willing to try when others wouldn't try. I couldn't help but think about with our first responders who often put, are put in that particular spot. To go where others won't go or wouldn't go, to try when others wouldn't try. I'm so thankful for them. And I would also add to that, we need Christians. We need Christians who will have the courage to stand for God. Not just stand in a first responder way, and I'm thankful for that, but we need Christians who will stand for God. We need those who will say, that, listen, I will stand for God, I will fight this battle. Proverbs says it, this, says it this way, if thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. I want to be a man of God who will stand for God. A man of God who will stand for God. Nope, you can't say that because you're talking about God right now and that's not okay. No? And then the, God, the Bible does not call us to be a jerk. Don't misunderstand me. But we're not called to be weak. And I see David, I see some courage, but I see some confidence. Let no man's heart fail. I'll go. There's a confidence, not a cockiness, but a certainty. Not a brashness, but a boldness. The Bible says some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Listen, what can God do? God can do anything, the song says, but fail. Listen, my friend, we need Christians who not only have a courage, but a confidence in God. Someone said it this way, too many of us are embarrassed and silent, secret agents for God. Too many of us are trying to, to do it in the comfort of our home. We will not make a significant and lasting impact unless we're willing to openly stand as Christians without apology for God. Years ago, there was an ocean liner. It was wrecked in a dangerous reef off the New England coast. 
The Coast Guard went out to rescue under the captaincy of an old seaman. But there were a few inexperienced young sailors in the Coast Guard on that crew. One of the youngsters turned with a, with a white face, the story goes, to the captain saying, Sir, the wind is offshore. The tide is running out. We can go out, but we can never come back. The captain said, Launch the boat. We have to go out. We don't have to come back. Courage. Courage is doing what you're afraid to do. There can be no courage unless you're scared. We need to have some courage. And I see here that David responded with some courage. Don't worry. I'll go. Don't fear. I'm your guy. Listen, stay in your tent. I'll go. But I see Saul's reaction of fear and failure. Look at verse 33 if you have your Bibles open. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine. I'm going to pause right there. You know anybody like that? And no matter what you say, they're going to tell you why it won't work. They're going to tell you why you're going to fail. The first thing Saul says, he doesn't say, boy, thanks, David. Boy, that's great. I appreciate your bravery. I appreciate your courage. Wow, someone finally to stand. Nope. First thing Saul says, you can't do it. You can't do it. You're a failure. You're going to fail. I don't even know why you're here, David. You can't have any success in this situation. He goes on to explain why he said this. For thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Oh, Saul was clever right there, wasn't he? He kind of turned the words a little bit. He said, David, you're just a boy. And he was fighting battles when he was just a boy. He said, David, listen, you are inexperienced. And Goliath is experienced. You are young and Goliath has been fighting since he was young. David, you are, you, you are small. Goliath is big. Saul says, David, it's not going to work. There was some disbelief there. What he saw didn't add up. David, you're only this tall. Goliath is that tall. David, what I'm seeing is not going to be successful. David, there's no way that this can happen. There was disbelief and there was doubt, a reaction of fear and failure. The one who should have fought, Saul, became the discourager. And my friend, in your life and in my life, there are times when we have giants in our life. There are problems. And we may respond in faith, God, you can do this. But be prepared. There will be those who will challenge your faith, who will, who will respond in fear and failure to you. I wish it wasn't the case. For four years, I was youth, I was youth pastor here at First Baptist Church. I remember one time in particular finishing up a summer camp. God had done some great things at that summer camp. A number of the teenagers had been touched by the hand of God. One that I remember distinctly in my mind had really made a great decision to follow God. One that I had prayed for by name specifically throughout the week. And on that particular Thursday night, this particular teenager really committed to God and followed God in an act of faith. Took some courage. I remember this story because the next day, the young person was getting picked up by their parents. They had come to me early in the morning or, or, or as they were packing up the camp, and they said, Pastor J.D., uh, they said, God did this and this. I'm so excited to see what God will do. And I was rejoicing with them, excited about the turnaround in their spirit and their life as they were going to follow God in a matter of faith with some courage. I remember when their parent pulled up. They were talking to me and expressing these spiritual truths. The young person was, and their parent pulled up. Rolled down the window. The parent said, hey, 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 get in the car. We're running late. I watched that teenager. Watched that young lady. Watched her face. And you just see, if I can, the life just sucked out of it. In my flesh, I wanted to slap the parent in my flesh. In my spirit, I'm thinking, what are you doing? I said a couple things to the teenager. Listen, God is good. You keep on. Wouldn't surprise you, though, that long term, that young person, if I were to tell you all where they're at today, you wouldn't be surprised. 
We all have to make our own decisions. We do. But there are times that there will be people who will try to discourage us. It's just reality. I wish it were different. And I see that right here. And that's what caught me this past week when I'm reading this account. I see David. He's all gung-ho. And King Saul, the leader of Israel, the one who should be fighting, the one who should say, listen, guys, I've got this. I'm your king. God will help me. Instead of that, he's just discouraging the faith of this young boy. (laughs) See, Christians, sometimes we're like the Africa Impala. They tell me that the Impala can jump to a height of 10 feet and cover a distance of 30 feet. Yet, I am told that these amazing creatures can be kept inside an enclosure with a three-foot wall. Because these animals will not jump if they cannot see where their feet will land. What I see David saying here, David said, I'm going to jump. I don't know where my feet will land. And Saul's saying, hold on. We're going to stay inside this three-foot wall. But I'm so thankful the story doesn't stop there, aren't you? Look real quick what happens quickly this morning in verse 32. I'm sorry, in verse 34, where David says, And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear. And took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go and the Lord be with thee. There was David's, uh, David had a focus in faith and Saul had fear of failure. But David came back with faithfulness of God and some fortitude. David said, Saul, I respect you, but let me tell you something. I was just a young man tending some sheep and this is what God did. There was a lion and a bear. I recalled what God did. And you know what? God will help me. What David is saying, listen, Saul, we have to let go and let God work. We need to be reminded this morning of the faithfulness of God. God is faithful. You may be searching for answers. And God does not decide to be faithful on a whim or because the sun is shining. God is faithful. The Bible tells us that he is faithful. He is faithful to his name, faithful to his character, faithful to his children. The faithfulness of God is rooted to who he is. God is faithful. So you may not be able to see what's on the other side of the fence. But God is faithful. You may not know what will happen tomorrow, but God knows what will happen tomorrow because he holds tomorrow. God is faithful. This morning, if I encourage your heart, I want to encourage you about God's faithfulness. He'll never, ever let you down. David says to King Saul, listen, let me tell you what God has done. Because of what he has done, I know what he will do. My friend, you may be here this morning, you may never have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. I'm here to tell you, let me tell you about what God has done. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. We have a big problem in our life, and the problem is called sin. The biggest problem that man faces is sin. And because of that sin, we don't deserve to go to heaven. But God loved us. He loved us and sent his son Jesus to die for us. The Bible says, but God commended. He showed his love toward us in that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Biggest problem we face is a sin problem. But God solved the problem. Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. Separation from God, but the gift of God. The gift of God. God made a gift for you and for me. The Bible says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I was six years old in junior church. When I prayed and I asked Jesus Christ to save me from my sin, I was a sinner. I hadn't lived 40 years in sin, but I had lived six years in sin. But I came just like everyone has to come, humbly asking Jesus to save me, and he did that that day. 
But that's not where it stops. That's just the beginning. Because of that, now I can live a life that pleases God and a life where I can rely upon the strength of God. And now, when I have a problem in my life, you know what I do? I pray. I ask other Christians for prayer. I go to the Word of God and I say, God, you've got to help me. And you know what? I can tell you story after story about God's faithfulness in financial situations, in relational situations, in, uh, in health situations where God is faithful. But you won't know that until you trust him. There will be some that say, you know what, Pastor, that sounds really nice. And it's really nice for you. But you don't know the giant that I face. And you're right, I don't. But he does. And just again to remind you, if the giant looks too big, you're looking through the wrong end of the binoculars. This morning, we need some Christians who will be remain faithful to God. I know Christians who responded with a focus on faith, but then someone discouraged them, and they stopped. They quit. They said, you're right, I can't. And this morning, let's remember the faithfulness of God. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, I pray you would help us. Lord, I don't know all the problems that are faced this morning, but you do. Lord, I wonder if there's a problem here that someone's been discouraged about. Would they look to you? Would they be reminded of your faithfulness and your mercies? Lord, would they again put their eyes on you and wait for your deliverance? With your heads bowed and eyes closed, I wonder if you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, as you were speaking, God spoke to me. I needed to be reminded of God's faithfulness this morning. I've been discouraged. I've been a little bit downhearted a little bit. But God touched my heart. Would you pray for me that I'd remember the faithfulness of God, what he's done before he can do again. I would say, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. I'll raise my hand. Would you pray for me this morning? Would you slip your hand up? Amen. I see that all over the place. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Who else? God bless you. God bless you. Who else? God bless you. God bless you. Amen. God bless you, sir. God bless you, man. God bless you. I wonder if you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I don't know that I've ever trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Maybe you've been in church your whole life, but being in church doesn't make someone a Christian. I wonder who would say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. When you pray for the others, would you pray for me? And my friend, I'll draw no more attention to you than I did to anyone else. Who would say with an upraised hand, Pastor, when you pray for them, would you pray for me? Here this morning, amen, I see that hand. Who else? God bless you. Amen, I see that. What if you're here this morning, you've never trusted Jesus Christ. You, you can trust him right where you're at. The Bible says that we must believe on Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means to put your trust in him. Believe that God sent his son to earth, that he lived and died on the cross to pay for sin and rose again. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I wonder if you're in your seat this morning, maybe in your heart you say, you know what? I'm not sure I'm saved, but I'd like to be sure. I wonder if you'd be able to ask Jesus to save you this morning. You can pray right where you're at. It's not magic in the words that you say. The Bible says, with the heart, man believeth. You could pray a simple prayer like this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. He was buried and rose again. I trust in him and him alone. Please save me. I wonder if where you're at this morning, you could pray that and mean that from your heart. Would you do that this morning for me? For yourself, for God? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Tell him, he'll hear you. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. You can pray it right in your heart. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. 
that he was buried and rose again. Please save me. I trust in Jesus and him alone. I wonder with your heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm the only one looking around up here, if you'd say, Pastor, I just prayed that and I meant that. I just asked Jesus to save me and I meant that from my heart. What do you say, Pastor, I did that. And as a testimony to that fact, would you slip your hand up? I just prayed that and I meant that. Amen. Amen. I see that hand. Who else? I just prayed that. God bless you. Who else? I just prayed that and I meant that just now. I asked Jesus to save me. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank you. Anyone else? In a moment after I pray, we'll have what we call an invitation here. We'll stand to our feet and there'll be folks at the front, men and ladies. If you'd like someone to pray with you this morning, you're We'd encourage you to come down and we have someone pray with you. You can pray by yourself. If you've trusted Jesus Christ, we'd love to talk to you about that. Lord, I thank you for this time. Lord, I pray for those who indicated that they they needed to be reminded of your faithfulness. Lord, I pray that you would keep that before us. Help us not to be discouraged. Of those who trusted you this morning, we praise you for that. Lord, if there's someone else here who has never trusted you, would you touch their heart today? Lord, bless this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen.